principles for today's Toastmasters meeting. I'm the Sergeant at Arms and I'm responsible for opening and closing the meetings today. Um, it is nice to see everyone and it is nice to see both new faces and old faces as we kick off this semester. I hope you guys are doing well and I hope your semester is going well and I wish you luck in the, in the future with all of the exams and all of the quizzes coming up. Uh, with that being said, um, would someone be willing to read our mission statement, which is at the bottom left-hand corner of the agenda on the screen? And I can't see um, all of you guys, but whoever volunteers, just go ahead and read it. I got you, Noah. Okay. We provide a supportive and positive learning experience in which members are empowered to develop communication and leadership skills, resulting in greater self-confidence and personal growth. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, with that being said, I will go ahead and pass it off to our president and Toastmaster of today, Slate Nations. Thank you, Noah. I'm so happy to see so many people here. We've got a lot of new faces and I can't wait to tell you guys all about UGA Toastmasters. So as Noah said, I am Slate Nations. I'm the current president of UGA Toastmasters. And I'm just so ready to share it all about it. First off, Toastmasters at Blanket is a public speaking club, but that sounds really boring. How I like to think of it is a way to work on your public speaking skills, improve your leadership skills, improve your confidence, as well as work on fellowship. You meet a lot of people here, can have a lot of fun, and I think that's the most important part, honestly. So I'm gonna start off first by going out our agenda and how a typical meeting works. It'll look a little bit different Typical meeting, we'll have the Toastmaster introduce the meeting just like I am now. And then after that, we'll have our reporters introduce themselves and how they'll work. And then have our speakers, which is the bulk of Toastmasters. Today, as you see, we will not have speakers, but in place of that, we'll have our second portion of the meeting, table topics. I'm gonna let our table topic master go more detail into that but that is a chance where everybody gets to participate, guests and people without roles. And then past that, we'll have our third and final section, which is evaluations, which is led by a general evaluator. And then if we have speakers, there are evaluators. And then our reporters will give their reports at the end. And that's how a typical meeting will look like. And that probably felt a little fast because I've done this probably 24 times, but just another quick refresher. The, you can keep that agenda up for everything we'll do. And if you're a guest, the part you can look forward to is table topics. Past that, I really think the best way to learn is by doing and participating. So by sitting back and listening to the meeting and by participating, you'll, you'll learn a lot. And definitely at the end, we'll have time, plenty of time for questions. A little bit more about Toastmasters. We are an international organization. So we are one chapter of many, many clubs. I don't have the exact number offhand, but I think there's well over 100,000 members and many clubs over not just North America, but all around the entire world. And it's just an incredible club. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people know about Toastmasters. Will you mention it? You can use it to leverage in job interviews or any other aspect of your life. With that said, I wanna go over a little Zoom etiquette. I know a lot of us, be used to this because of our classes and other things we're involved in in this new environment but some simple things would be uh, always mute yourself if you're not speaking so i can just be found and mute and then make sure to unmute and then another fun thing we do is try and being a little sense of i don't like the word normalcy but of when we're in person we have a lot of traditions at our club one of them would be we're really big on clapping whenever someone would leave or enter the stage. So in place of that, we just use the reactions, the clapping one. So you'll see that going on a lot throughout the meeting, I'll try and keep that up. And then steal a little bit of thunder from our Marion. We also have an award of the day every day. We also use the thumbs up in place of snapping. Doesn't quite replace it, but we like to snap whenever someone says the word of the day. So those really are just the two big things I'd like to mention. Uh, the one other thing is have your video camera on. I think everyone does, which is awesome. With that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our reporters, starting with the grammarian. Soren, can you introduce your role? 
Hi, there's slides. So I'll be serving as the grammarian for this meeting. So as the grammarian, my role is to simply look at your guys' diction to see your uh, verbiage and like the type of words you're using, as well as I decide the word of the day. So today's word is going to be enigma. So enigma means it's another word for mystery. And so it means something that's puzzling, uh, ambiguous, or inexplicable. So if you use the word of the day in your any of your speeches or table topics, uh, I'll just write that down and be sure to tell you. And if you do say the word of the day, we have this tradition where we uh, snap, but since you can't like snap to indicate that you've used the word of the day, we're just gonna use the thumbs up as Slate's demonstrating. So thank you, Slate. That's all I have to say for my role. Thank you. Thanks, Soren. Next up, I'm gonna call the awe counter, which is Tori today. You can go ahead and explain the role. Hey guys, I'm Tori. So the all counter is pretty much, it's pretty basic explanation. I just count your so's, likes, ums, or if you trail on a lot. And then I will tell you at the end how much, you know, how much was added up for each person. And that's it. Thanks, Tori. And don't let that intimidate you at all. It's just a tool to help you become a better speaker because filler words are only there to distract from your speech. And our last reporter would be Timer. Adana, can you please explain your role and how you'll be performing that today? Hey guys, I'm Adana, the timer. So basically I'll be timing your speeches. We're only doing table topics. So in the chat, make sure to check for the chat. When your speech hits one minute, I'll say one minute in the chat. Uh, once it hits one minute and 30 seconds, I'll say um, one minute and 30 seconds in the chat. And once it hits two minutes, I will say two minutes in the chat. So you have the minimum of reaching one minute and the maximum of hitting two minutes and try not to go over or under. That's it. Thanks, Adana. And one more thing about our table topics, still just a little bit of thunder again, but uh, in our normal means, we'll vote for best speaker when we have speakers as well as best evaluator and the one we can do today is best table topic speaker and so make sure to pay attention to the vote for your favorite all right and that will conclude our reporters announcing how they'll be leading their role i will now pass it off to one of our two table topic masters today trisha and trisha i'm gonna let you take away Thank you, Slate, and good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to be back with all of you this spring semester. So like Slate mentioned, I will be serving today as one of two Table Topics Masters. And the goal of Table Topics is really to help you improve your impromptu speaking. So as a Table Topics Master, myself and the second person, Noah, so we'll be asking questions and you have one to two minutes to respond. You know, you do have a bit of leeway wherein you can um, reach or rather stay under 15 seconds of the minimum. So at the very, very minimum, try to reach 45 seconds. And at the very maximum, you have 30 seconds after the two minute period. So 2.30, that's when you should really, really cut it off. So just a way to work on your timing. Uh, as like mentioned before, we have our timer at Donna. She'll be keeping track of time. So when it's your turn to answer a question, you can go ahead and um, just keep an eye on the time so that she'll be the one informing you when it's time for you to wrap up. So when you hit that one minute mark, that 130, that two minute, and that'll be very, very helpful. Now, that being said, we have two themes, just like we have two sets of questions. And the theme that we will be first going through is winter. So I know winter can be at times a little finicky in Georgia, but you know, we'll, we'll work our way around it. Um, I guess some, some tips and I You can turn the question completely on its head. So whether, yeah, well, get into it. And with that, we will go to our first question, which is, okay. Are y'all seeing my screen just to make sure? Okay. Have you ever had the chance to make a snowman? If yes, what was your best one? And if no, what would you start? 
Same. I can take this first one, Trisha. No one else got it for me. And, and your uh, um, screen's a little choppy. Heads up. Yeah. Let's try that again. Um, all right. Great. Show us how it's done. <laughs> yeah, so just to answer your question, Yasmin, anyone can go ahead and volunteer for a question. If no one volunteers, then might have to do some finagling and ask, volunteer someone to <laughs> volunteer for a question. Um, but if you'd like to go ahead and answer this question or any of the questions afterwards, feel free to just speak up, start talking, and that's when your time will start. All right, so have I ever had a chance to build a snowman? Yes, I have. And surprisingly, it was at my home here in Jefferson, Georgia, which might come as a shock because it hasn't snowed here in forever. So this was when I was very young, probably a decade ago. And it's, now that I think about it, really a cherished memory because I remember having a bonding time with my dad. We just built the biggest snowman. My dad, he's a tall guy at 6'4", and I remember building the snowman taller than him. Just like you see in all the cartoons and movies, you just start the small ball and then keep rolling and rolling it till you get that size you want for the bottom piece. And you start over, but then you got to pick it up and put it on there and then do it one third and final time. And I also remember decorating it. I think we had the classic carrot nose past that. I don't remember what I had for the eyes. It was probably some pieces of chocolate or something funny like that. I think that that's just really something that everyone should experience. And I know a lot of us haven't gotten that chance because it doesn't snow here often. So I can't recommend it enough. Thanks, Trisha. Thank you, Slate. Yeah, I mean, Snowman, you can definitely be super creative with it. Um, like you said, using, I, know, I never thought of using like, what did you mention, like chocolate or something for like the eyes, that's super cute. I'm mean, usually, I just like, you know, the classic with using the movies, using buttons and like Olaf and like sticks for arms. So awesome, thank you, Slate. So our next one. Is go. All right, there we go. What do you think about Santa Claus? Love him, hate him, think he's the greatest thing to ever grace this earth, think there needs to be changes of the tales? Uh, I think I can answer this one, Trisha. All right, go ahead, Soren. Okay, so Santa Claus is a very mixed character, so. If we think about it, he's giving us presents, right? But what is he asking in return? Has it ever come upon you? Why is he just giving us presents for being nice? Like, what does he gain out of this, right? So, like, I had many of these theories, like, when I was really young, and I was like, what if Santa was, like, secretly evil? Like, he's giving us these gifts, right? But in exchange, he's, like, stealing our niceness for some devious, malicious purpose. So I know this theory itself is, like, very far-fetched, and I haven't really been able to see where it could go forth. But Santa himself is an enigma, correct? So we don't really know exactly where Santa came from, what he is. For a while, we know he could be an alien. He could have come from like Mars or something like that. And what we're learning about when we think about Santa Claus coming into our homes, giving us presents, could simply be an alien coming inside and like trying to harvest our brains or something like that. We have no knowledge about any of this. So I think uh, for the legal purposes, I um, think that uh, the United States Air Force and various other, um, like NASA should start investigating the North Pole, especially air the um, area around the North Pole, the airspace during the Christmas season to see if we can find that man and um, to bring him to justice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Soren. And wow, what a colorful picture of just who is really Santa Claus, right? That, that is true. There is a lot of things that we don't know about him. So thank you for that, Soren. All right, we'll go to our next one, which is what is your favorite food to eat on a snowy day? Or if you haven't experienced a snowy day, like this full on snow picture, what do you, what's your favorite to, food to eat on a cold, cold day? Like perhaps today, today was actually kind of cold, but that could just be me. I can try. 
All right, go ahead, Yasmin. Okay, when do I start? I'm so like new at this. <laughs> yeah, you just start whenever. If you want to think on what your response is for a couple of seconds, silence is welcome too. And once you start speaking, that's when your time starts. Uh, okay, let's try this. Um, I don't really have a favorite food on a snowy day, but I will tell you the perfect scenario if it were to snow outside. First of all, I would only go outside for pictures, have my sisters build a snowman and take a picture next to it. Second of all, I hate the cold, meaning that I will sit there, turn up my heater blanket on, lay in bed, grab my ice cream. I'll probably have one of my siblings go grab me some Brewsters, sit there with some ice cream, some chips, all the junk food that I could find, kind of just lay in bed and turn on some Netflix and probably rewatch a show. Honestly, it's such a betrayal from Netflix to take off Gossip Girl. By the way, today is National Gossip Girl Day for anyone who didn't know. <laughs> so um, I definitely feel betrayed considering that I was like halfway through my fifth way of watching my f uh, this is my fifth time watching Gossip Girl for the fifth year uh, fifth year in a row so I feel so betrayed that they took it off anyways I feel like soup is definitely the food to, like your to-go food to eat on a snowy day because it is so freaking cold outside and nothing better to warm you up than a bowl of soup so aside from that I'd probably have someone also bring me some Chick-fil-A fries because you can't be, you know, some waffle fries on such a cold day, especially if they're salted just right. Um, I don't know if my time came on. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to stop here. <laughs> Blair is the best character. I know. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Yasmin. And great job turning the question a little bit on its head, kind of expanding on um, on expanding on it, bringing other scenarios. So that's certainly like the kind of thinking that and creativity that anyone can go with the table topics question. So thank you. I don't know if I was allowed to do that. So I was kind of just like, oh no, yeah, literally to, like, it, the box about? is completely open when it comes to table topics, no limitations at all. So great job and awesome dedication. I don't think I've ever had a de dedication to a show like that, except maybe. <laughs> When I was younger and there was like Saturday cartoons, who knows? <laughs> yeah, no, awesome. I felt so betrayed. Took it off December 31st. Yeah. All right, we'll go to our next question. So imagine you're interviewing a winter animal. Which animal would you be interviewing? What would you talk about? What would that conversation be like? And so on the slides, I have some examples like an owl, a fox, a bear, but you can definitely go with whatever winter animal you'd like. Okay. I can okay. go. Oh, oh, go ahead. Is that okay, uh, Trisha? I go? Yeah, go ahead, Justin. Okay. Oh, who's going? I, I, I would really like to interview a polar bear because polar bears are awesome. I mean, who doesn't like a polar bear? Like, I understand if you don't like it, if you're worried that the polar bear is going to eat you, that's understandable. And you probably should, you know, get away from that. But polar bears are a great animal. So here's how I can think the conversation would go. Something, something like this. So, polar bear. It's pretty, pretty cold outside, isn't it? Polar bears go. Uh-huh. Okay, well, have you have you been eating anyone's trash lately or anyone's interesting things, you know, like anything in the trash? Well, you know, I was going to the trash can and this these people decided to cook some hot dogs. And so I just gave this really loud roar and they took off and left the camp. And I just went up and I snatched their hot dogs and I had 20 of them, 20 hot dogs. It was the best time of my life. I was like, really? I'm like, wow. I'm like, so how do you, how do you keep warm, polar bear? Like, you know, is it all your fur? Or what do you do? I'm like, well, yeah, my fur is really nice. And sometimes I go hang out with the caribou uh, up in Alaska. And we hang out and do all kinds of things. We sit around the, the oil pipeline and get really warm because, you know, they were nice to put this long metal heater here. So we just sit there and, uh, you know, have a kumbaya, sing polar bear songs. It's really nice. Like, wow. Well, that's all the time I have for you, polar bears. Thank you so much. You've been so kind talking to me. 
No, no problem, man. It's been great. Enjoyed this conversation. And with that, back to you, Trisha. Thank you, Justin. And wow, what, what a story with a polar bear. I don't know uh, what kind of questions out of them, but the response of hot dogs, hey, you know, they can do whatever they want. <laughs> I don't know how they'd find them, but yeah, there you go. <laughs> and we can go to our next question. Sorry. Oh, come on. There we go. All right, describe in detail the sensation of going from the cold, blustery outdoors to the warm indoors. What's that feeling like? What are the sensations like? I can give this one a try. All right, go ahead, Courtney. So for me personally, I do not enjoy the cold. I talk to this, I'll talk about this with my friends constantly that I do not wanna go on ski trips. I don't wanna go visit Alaska. I don't wanna see the nor Northern Lights. I, I don't care, I don't enjoy the cold. And so for me, the experience of going from my warm heated apartment out into the wintry weather outside is very unpleasant. I just find it chilling in my bones. I'm cold everywhere. Nothing gets warm fast enough once I do get back into the heat. Um, and I would just prefer if everything just stayed warm uh, most of the time, because, you know, who needs those extremes in your life? Who needs to go from hot and cold um, so quickly like that? I don't think it's necessary. I think that it's much better to be able to go outside in some shorts or a dress, you know, the fashion's better in the summer. Just so many things are so much better about the um, summer warm season and the winter is just cold and miserable and dark. Um, it messes up your melatonin and your uh, sleep schedule. Uh, people get more depressed, uh, studies say, during the winter because of the shorter days and the colder weather. And of course, with COVID right now, we do not need um, anything else hurting our immune systems. So I welcome the summer. Thank you guys. Thank you, Courtney, and what a compelling case. Just, you know, stay warm, stay cuddled, or stay safe. So, awesome job, Courtney. Thank you. Our next table topics. Oh, this one. What would a snowflake think as it falls to earth? So this is another kind of like personification kind of question. We'll be running through the thoughts of a snowflake. Or what would it see? What would it sense? What would it smell? Whatever you think a snowflake would think as it falls to earth. I'll, I'll give this one a try. All right. Is that, okay, I can't quite see everyone. Is that you, Jackson? Yep, that's me. All right, go ahead. So I like to think that snowflakes live lives not that different from us. You know, they, they, they spend their lives essentially getting born inside of a cloud, you know, like a a holistic, puffy, comfortable atmosphere. You know, they're surrounded by all their friends and, and they get to like grow into this, you know, beautiful, unique snowflake on themselves. And, you know, that experience of when they actually slip away and fall, I'm sure is very, very nerve wracking. And if it's anything like people, people are either, they kind of look at that jump as a leap of faith. Or they look at that jump as them being dragged down to earth. So I think a lot of snowflakes are kind of split between that, you know, that decision of just sheer terror, you know, they're skydiving, you know, they're falling, feeling the wind. And I think when, once they reach about probably about the halfway point, they kind of realize that it's the fall is inevitable and all they have the ability to do is enjoy the process while they're there. And they got to look forward to the ground they have that they're going to arrive at at the very bottom. And that's sort of like us going through life in a way, you know, where we're falling no matter what. It's, you know, we might know the exact time of when, we might not know where exactly we're going to land, but the only thing we really have the ability to do is kind of enjoy the breeze on the way down and enjoy the view. And, you know, once you reach the ground, you know, it's a matter of just returning to earth and, and giving back to the world. So I think, I think snowflakes are, are a lot like us in that aspect. Thank you, Jackson, and great response. I love like the philosophical route. You kind of went with it, you know? Yeah, I mean, 
I mean, each snowflake is unique, which thinking how many snowflakes and just how many there are, it's kind of hard to imagine that it is, but there you go. <laughs> awesome job, Jackson. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our next table topics question. Ooh, imagine you're trapped indoors by a wild and unexpected blizzard. What would be one of your journal entries on those days before you are freed? Maybe think of the motions you might think of or what you might reflect on, or maybe you're thinking of your survival skills. Sky's the limit. Okay, I can do this one. All right, go ahead, Nadia. I have always known and will always know that in any kind of apocalypse or survival situation, I'm just going to kill myself. I can't do it. I legitimately cannot. If there's ever like some kind of zombie apocalypse, okay, I'm dead. It's not worth it. It's not worth being alive. I promise you that. I, my standard of living is higher than that. And you know what? If I was stuck in the cold, in the cold, uh, -uh immediately dead, immediately dead. Like I, I cannot hunt for animals. I cannot do that. I do know a lot of plants. I could probably eat some plants, but God, no, I just wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to. And you know, you hear those stories about someone being like, oh, they got caught like under a rock or in some cold place, like their plane crashed. And then they have to like cut off their own body parts and like eat it or like eat other people. <gasps> what kind of psycho? No, mm -mm, no, I just rather die. Genuinely, I would rather die. Oh, my journal entry. Oh, my bad. <laughs> um, my journal entry would be probably a suicide note. I'm sorry. <laughs> a little bit dark, but you know, it, it is it, it is a tough situation. And sometimes when you hear those stories and you see it if it's either in news or movies, yeah. I mean, it's great that like we have a lot of resources kind of just like like the trade and everything, but just like each individual's knowledge of just survival in general has completely gone down since like the last 200, 300 years. So yeah, can't judge really until you're in that situation. My great response, Nadia. And now we'll go to our next table topics. So describe winter as a person. What would they be like? How would they dress? Who are its friends? So this one is like another personification, imaginary type. What would be their characteristics or their personality? Am I allowed to do this? Timer. Yeah. yeah, you're definitely allowed to, Adana. Okay. Would you like someone else to time for you, or you think you can time yourself? I, I think I can time myself. I can do this. All yeah. right. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so first of all, winter is a pretty cold season, a season where most people do not like, because when I think of winter, I think of someone's cold heart a heart that's not able to feel warmth, but instead pain, negativity, and just all the bad things with the world. How would they dress? The first thing I could think of is Elsa from Let It Go with the pretty dress, being alone and being isolated from the world. And who are its friends? Nobody, because nobody likes the cold. But maybe the, maybe the pessimistic friends, maybe the people who are not willing to be happy in this world, maybe the people who are also cold hearted. All I know is that if winter was a person, I would not want to be associated with them. The end. <laughs> Wow, thank you, Adana. I mean, in that beginning part, I was definitely thinking, oh, it sounds like she's describing the plot of, of Frozen, and then sure enough, you mentioned it. <laughs> but certainly um, in literature, movies, pop culture, there's many depictions of, or at least like people or things that symbolize winters, so like you mentioned Elsa, or you think Narnia, the White Witch, or Legends of the Guardians, Jack Frost. So definitely different, different personalities. Could be quite an enigma, who, had, who could say? All right, we'll go to our next table topics question, which is, ooh, explain in detail how to make the best hot chocolate or your favorite hot beverage if you're not into hot chocolate. Wow, 
what are the steps involved? Maybe there's a creative leeway in substitution of ingredients. I can go again if nobody wants this one. <laughs> Let's see, let, let, let me give, give it another 10, 15 seconds. Yeah, no, yeah, give it some more time. I'll try this one. All right, go ahead, Joanne. I love hot chocolate. I like my own hot chocolate better than I like the packaged stuff. I think it's artificial, but I'll, I love whole milk. So I'll, I'll take a cup of whole milk and just let it warm slowly on the stove. No putting it in the microwave. Just, just let it warm slowly on top of the stove and keep it sort of whipped. When it's hot enough for me, I dump the, the cocoa over in there with just a little sugar, not a whole lot, just enough for me to enjoy it and that it's comfortable. Too sweet sort of goes, yuck. But then because I like mint, why not dump a thin mint over in there, a peppermint patty, and just sort of whip it while it's still on the stove, whip it a little, let it get thick enough, and mm, yum, yum, dump some marshmallows on, on top and go, whoo, I think that's going to work. And by the way, sip it just very slowly. Mm, close your eyes and taste the mint, taste the sugar, taste that whole milk. But you know, one thing that we could add is the heavy cream, just add some, some richness in there as well. Now, I'll worry about the pounds later, but I think that would make a wonderful and soothing and yum yum cup of hot chocolate. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. That's, that's awesome. And I think like mentioned in the chat, um, the reason why I included this question was because I was making a lot of hot chocolate over break. And oh my gosh, there's so many variations, but we can definitely talk more after this meeting. We'll share each other's secrets on the best of you because I can only imagine that the next month and a half, two months, maybe three months will still be a little cold. And you know, might be craving that comfort food, comfort drink. So thank you, Miss Joanne. We have... I have two more questions in this table topic set um, before we transition into the next uh, next table topics set of questions. So the second to the last question, suppose you're in the Winter Olympics, which sport or sports, if you're a really motivated athlete, are you participating in and why? What's it like to compete in those sports? I can take this one. All right, go ahead, Tori. All right, so which sport am I participating in? Unlike the majority of y'all, I do actually really like the cold and I kind of grew up going skiing a lot and snowboarding a lot, um, ice skating. I actually recently just went ice skating and it was a lot of fun, <laughs> even though, you know, you have to bundle up a lot. But which sport, if I had to pick one, it would probably be snowboarding just because I love it so much. Um, skiing, I think, is a little bit too hard because you have to use both. Well, you have to use both legs for snowboarding, but for skiing, you have to use both as in like they can cross. And trust me, if you take a tumble, you, you don't want to take a tumble and ski as you, you'd rather do it snowboarding. But I'm a, definitely a super competitive person. Uh, when I was younger, I would like, <laughs> I used to play lacrosse. And so I would go um, midi and I would run up and down the field and I would try to score as many goals as I could. So when it came to snowboarding, I also became super competitive with my brother and you know how siblings go. And since then I have really enjoyed being competitive or in games and also skiing with my family. And I think it'd be cool to do that in the Olympics as well. I wish that um, it would come back to Atlanta soon. And if it did catch me there. So <laughs> that's all I got. Awesome. Thank you, Tori. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally haven't done too many winter stuff. I think I once tried ice skating last year just at the rink in Athens, which is really cool. Um, but like I had never rollerblade or anything before. So it's definitely like a learn, fall down, pick yourself up kind of process. But yeah, that's certainly on my bucket list just to try those winter sports because I've lived in Georgia most of my life. So not too many experiences here in our state, but awesome job, Tori, thank you. 
Um, so before we go to the last one in this set, if you haven't had a chance to answer a question, don't worry, we do have another set, so there's plenty more opportunities. So just wanted to assure everyone that there's that there are more opportunities to test your public speaking out. So the last one in this set, what activities do you like to do in winter? Why? So this is kind of a bit of a culmination. It can be an activity you like to do. It can be food you like to make, people that you like to hang out with. Sky's the limit. I can take this one. All right, go ahead, Lee. Okay, so during the winter, I like to do a mix of activities that we mentioned in the past. The first of which is build a snowman. So to build a snowman, you gotta find the widest, most pristine snow you can find and start rolling it up. In the past, what happened is sometimes my sister and I would try to conduct surgery to build the perfect snowman, but of course, chunks of it would fall off and we'd have to gather its remaining organs. Sometimes the whole snowman just fell apart. So we decided to salvage it the best we can. And we did that by making hot chocolate. Now we took the broken pieces of the snowman inside, melted it, and made our own hot chocolate recipe, which was sugar, chocolate, sugar, Reese's pieces, and more sugar. Unfortunately, I didn't know that when you melted snow, it's kind of a grayish liquid, but that didn't stop us as kids, so we proceeded to drink our concoction of polluted snow, chocolate, and sugar. Furthermore, we would have a lot of snowball fights, and we get really aggressive with snowball fights. We would get ice cubes in the center and pack snow around it and throw it as hard as we could. That day, um, we all came back with blisters and it was one of the best days I've had in winter. Thank you. Sorry about that, took me a bit to find my mute button. But thank you, Lee. Wow, when, you, I, when I heard you say the, the Reese's Pieces, like, wait, that's a really good idea for hot cocoa. And then I forgot that y'all use the snow <laughs> from outside. So maybe just replace the snow with, you know, some, some tap water and uh, that'll be another <laughs> hot cocoa recipe to follow up on. All right, so that's it for the, my set of questions. Um, We'll do votes at the end of Noah's set of questions, but before I pass it back to Slate, Adana, we're all our speakers in time. Oh, yes, I think sorry. so. Yeah, just like scrolling up through. It looks like everyone at least made the one minute mark. So congrats everyone. And with that, I will go ahead and pass it back to Slate. Slate, take it away. Thank you, Trisha. So that's just part one of our table topics. We got a few more to go. And our second one will be Noah. And I'll give Noah a few more seconds to pull his up if he hasn't already. And just want to say real quick, they've been awesome so far, both with the questions and answers. So looking forward to our second half. Um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to, to Noah here for table topic 